As Steve mentioned, I'm a co-founder of Public Good, which is a social impact tech company based here in Chicago. So for everyone that traveled in, sorry, it's horrendously biting cold, even though it's March. Um, I think that it's just cold everywhere this week, but particularly biting here. Um, but I'd love to get a sense for who's in the room. So would you mind raising your hand so I can better tailor our, our conversation today? Would you mind raising your hand if you're on kind of a company brand side of things? Okay. Raise your hand if you're from the nonprofit side of things. <coughs> Interesting. Okay, great. That's really helpful. Um, awesome. So I wanted to start by recognizing that everybody in this room is working to make the world a better place in, in, in different ways and to just thank you for the work that you do. I think it's really important. Um, and my hope is that you'll come away with new actionable things to bring back to your workplace, um, as well as some interesting data. So I'm really excited to share some innovative data. And to give you some context from where we are able to draw this kind of data, just wanted to spend a minute um, talking about what public good does um, to drive data around impact. This isn't confidential, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cover slide for another deck of apologies. So you can talk about this widely. Um, so what Public Good does is we make the news actionable. So when you're reading a story about domestic violence or the opioid crisis, a natural disaster, someone affected by the California wildfires, we give readers actions they can take. You can see here on that article to make a difference on the cause. In this example, this is an article about dogs that were rescued. So some of the actions the reader can take are reading more about this, sponsoring an animal, volunteering at my local shelter, and pledging to end puppy mills. These um, actions can also be sponsored by brands that are doing work on that cause. This gives companies the opportunity to spread awareness of the good work that they're doing, engage people in their social impact programs, and empower people to make a difference on that cause. So our mission is really to kind of harness that emotion and that feeling you feel when you're really engaged with good journalism and allow you to, to, to make a difference. Um, and so at the kind of at the highest level, if we think about content, you know, it's been likable and shareable for a long time now. You know, we're really working to make good content actionable so we can, we can make a difference. So uh, this gives you a sense of we're implemented across of, uh, many of America's leading networks. We have a huge amount of scale. As you can see, we're partnered with the leading mm -hmm. news networks. And wanted to kind of mention that the, the concept of attaching a nonprofit to a news story, like the Red Cross to natural disasters, is not new, right? We've, that's been happening for years. What's different about what we're doing is that we've taken a tech-driven approach. And that's what's made it scalable. So we help hundreds and thousands of people um, every month make a difference on the things that they care about. So the way we do that is our platform uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to analyze our partner publishing partners' articles. And at that moment of publication, if there's a cause, then actions appear to support the cause. If there's no cause, then we hide ourselves. And so that has made it, um, as you can see, scalable across major networks. So from this, we're able to garner some really interesting data. So I pulled some here, um, just based in Chicago, obviously this is nationwide, but since we're in Chicago today, um, what we're looking at here is top actioned causes kind of across time. So what this shows us is what people are most focused on changing at a certain point in time, when that cause becomes very important. So um, we see immigration came a second actioned cause in 2016 which isn't surprising. That was Trump's campaign year, that was the election year, it was in the news, and it became a really important cause for people to stand up behind. Uh, if we look at last year, support racial justice. So this was the second actioned cause of 2018. It wasn't even in the top 10 in 2016. Mm -hmm. But with the police shooting of the Queen McDonald, this became a really important issue across Chicago, and we saw this um, reflected, reflected in the data. So enough about Chicago, enough about the state of the news. Um, we're here to talk about you know, the power of empowering people to take action alongside us. Um, so I want to take a second and, and ask you to raise your hand again. Um, first of all, who's heard of the NHL? <laughs> Damn, I'm trying to get people moving after lunch. Keep your hand up. <laughs> okay. 
keep your hand up if you've ever heard of the Hockey is for Everyone pro social impact program that the NHL does. Okay, I have, okay, one, yeah, so two, yeah, so um, I'm gonna do it again because we just ate lunch. Raise your hand if you've heard about Vaseline. <laughs> keep your hand up if you've heard of Vaseline's The Healing Project. Yeah, interesting, so Vaseline is a little more well known. Both are phenomenal programs. They both do a ton of good. But as we can see, there's not a lot of awareness about these social impact programs. And so this kind of brings us to kind of a question of why involve your customers? Why let your customers know? A lot of brands do a lot of amazing work and have significant social impact investment on change, but aren't focused on telling their story. So if we kind of look back over time, we see here's Andrew Carnegie, you know, your kind of classic philanthropy, you know, I'm doing good for good sake, you know, he's known for having great values and doing a lot of good change, but U.S. Steel didn't really participate in that glow of good work that was done. Now compare that with Tom Shoes. So with Tom Shoes, they've got a ton of brand cred, um, and they're really known for their social impact, and this has given them the business drivers. So people knowing how focused they are on purpose have given them the business drivers to justify giving away a pair of shoes for every <coughs> pair of shoes bought. So, you know, as we think about this, 87% um, of consumers, we kind of dig into the data, pick between competitive products based on whether the brand aligns with their social and environmental causes. So I think stats like this can be seen as the beginning uh, of a journey between taking a company's purpose and then aligning it with profitability and revenue. And to the extent that we can bring those two together and we can begin to make purpose core, then you know, your purpose programs aren't one earnings call away from being reduced. And when there's a down revenue year, those social impact programs are still core. So instead, um, social impact can become kind of a key growth driver not something that's at risk and stuck on the side. So really what this data is about is kind of beginning to make that business case around how social impact can really help drive your, your business. And, and customers are voting with their, with their wallets. So you know, we look at like the three big tenets. There's quality, um, we've got price and purpose. And when they're compared head to head, for the first time ever, the data released last year from Cone showed that purpose was put ahead of price. Big shift. Customers really care. So the social impact, um, really, truly, these programs drive loyalty. They drive sales, which in turn is, is important because it gives you the business justification to make it core. And when it's core, it can grow and flourish, and the business can do, can do more good. So here, taking it a step further, um, one of the most uh, compelling ways to tell your story about the good that you're doing is to tell your story while inviting someone to take action alongside you. In other words, make them part of the story. And then you're doing it together. That also avoids the concept of a company doing good and then patting themselves on the back for what they've done. No, make it a, make it a story and you can make it together. And so um, with this, you know, some of the data that's, that's come out in the last six months, more than 69% of consumers want to work alongside a brand on social impact. You know, they're finding that you know, government isn't standing behind the social causes that are important to them, and they're looking to businesses to help them make a difference, both directly and, and indirectly. Just um, would love some kind of feedback from the audience. Is this surprising? Is this not surprising? Before we kind of tick forward, would love any kind of kind of comments or thoughts to make it a little more interactive. I have a comment. <clears throat> Great. So I've worked in uh, consumer market research for over 30 years. So I was seeing and your so, head not a lot. So. <laughs> so I have to tell you that whole that the last statistic mm -hmm. about um, purpose over price. Yes. Okay. For the last 35 years, it has been. Price, convenience, and you know, delivery on the promise. Sure. Are the top three. Yes. Yeah. They vary in order. Mm -hmm. Always the top three. That is profound. That is profound that purpose has superseded price. Wow. That's a really big deal. Thanks for calling that out. 
I find all of this a very big deal, <laughs> so I appreciate the reinforcement. There was one other comment. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, so when you say purpose, how do you, do you prove that out in terms of, you know, I can say that I, I, that I want to buy shoes that have a purpose, but do I actually buy them, or is price still the overriding factor? Yeah, so what that, stu what that study is, is poking at is that consumers had said they would pay more for a brand that stands behind their social values for the first time last year in 2018. And so the answer is people will pay more for something that aligns with their values. Um, and that's a shift. And all these data points, by the way, are higher when you segment them per the millennial generation. But do we know that they do? Do we know that, oh, in practice? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think one way you can cut at that is looking at companies that have both purpose brands and non-purpose brands. So Unilever is a great example. Typically, their, their purpose brands way outperform their non-purpose brands. Mm -hmm. So we see it in, in the earnings um, and through you know, studies. An another great example is Economist wrote um, an article about how companies that have a strong net promoter score and sense of value and strong brand sentiment, when the chips are down, and if you're a big company, there's always going to be a day when you get caught in a PR you know, fire. Um, the companies that have a, a strong customer sense for their values, their stock rebounds faster afterwards. So a good example of this, and sorry for anyone in the rooms at another company, but um, you know, United uh, had a really tough PR situation last year, and that was really game changing for United when the, you know, the customer was dragged off the plane, and it was tough, and they, you know, that has really focused a look at what is our net promoter score, what do people think about our brand, versus Starbucks, if we look at Post Philadelphia, I mean, their stock price rebounded fairly quickly, and that was a really big and bad incident. So there is data to show that not only are people paying for it more, but these companies that are putting more behind having a purpose brand um, are doing better in terms of, of growth, in terms of product sales, and in terms of kind of surviving um, within the public eye during a PR crisis. Great, thanks for interactivity. Um, so I want to I want to talk a little bit more about kind of the the action piece. So we're just looking at a stat that showed how consumers want to take action alongside a brand. So that's what consumers want. Now let's take a look at what does that do for the brand. So what we're looking at here is a traditional marketing funnel. We've got awareness at the top. So if we think about a brand um, telling their story about the social impact that they're doing, that's very much at the awareness level. And it's part of the funnel, but it's at the top of the funnel. When you empower someone to take action along beside you and you convert them to doing something, then it's pulling them down that funnel through consideration, conversion, loyalty, and ultimately to be a brand ambassador. So action, consumer action alongside your brand is actually one of the most powerful, well, the most powerful tool we've seen in the data to create a brand ambassador um, for, your, for your organization. And in terms of, um, Proving this out with data, we did a case study here around Net Promoter Score. So Net Promoter Score is, of course, the gold standard for consumer sentiment around a brand. And the research overwhelmingly says that companies that lead a category with Net Promoter Score perform above their competitors. So it's a good indicator of which companies are going to kind of thrive and survive in a category. And so. What we saw was that we did a case study with a company that had a very neutral net promoter score. So kind of plus minus five, depending on the time period that you looked at their net promoter score. Then we looked at, for a customer that took a pro-social action alongside that brand, and it was actually through our tech, um, what did the net promoter, what did the brand sentiment look like for those people who had done something alongside the brand? It was 92. You know, and like we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, we re-ran and re-ran and re-ran the data. It moved brand sentiment from neutral to brand ambassador. Because when people do something they care about, it's, it's the holy grail. It's just really, really powerful. Um, so net promoter score is something that um, hasn't traditionally been associated with CSR, hasn't traditionally been associated with social impact. Um, we are evangelizing this because we really see the power behind um, once boards and investors um, and companies understand the power behind social impact, then it can become more core and our businesses can do an even more effective job 
at, at creating social change. So, sorry for all the hand raises, but I was wondering, is there anyone here that does look at Net Promoter Score in relation to the work that they do? This is really new, so no surprises if you don't, but curious. Great. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you look at it? So, previous company, not my current one, um, we looked at NPS uh, all the time around uh, how were we um, getting more uh, fewer detractors, and it was a measure of success in the organization yeah. um, for the specific products that we were working on. So if the, one of the OKRs for the team would have been to increase their net promoter score by 20 points or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, it's certainly something that we did a lot of looking at. Great. And then what department were you in in that company? Oh, I am, I'm in HR, but, okay. uh, but the product teams that we supported were right. using the NPS. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's another hand around here. Are you willing to talk about sure. what you use? Um, we actually use it for employee engagement purposes. And okay. Just sort of um, how our employees feel about our organization. And we have used it to, I also work for a nonprofit organization, and we have used it to a certain degree with our donors um, in limited, Great. in small <coughs> fights. Um, but we've had some really interesting results from that as well. Great. Thanks for sharing. Awesome. So um, as we're focusing on kind of talking about action, I wanted to kind of reflect on, on the overarching trend that we're, we're seeing now. So on the left-hand side, um, we can kind of see a continuum here where you know, traditionally companies focused on, on doing good for good's sake. We think about foundations, think about our friend Andrew Carnegie that we saw earlier. There's an increasing trend over time in terms of storytelling and spreading awareness about the um, social impact programs that the company has. And then now today, we're really seeing the trend in many of you know, leading <coughs> brands, and many of these brands are partnering with nonprofits. So I think for all the nonprofits in, in the room, you know, important to know, as I'm talking about brands and their social impact, many of these actions are nonprofit actions. And so we, we serve as a matchmaker between nonprofits and, and brands all the time because you have the things people can directly do on the ground to, to make a difference. And so um, some brands that come top of mind around action, State Farm, we've heard of their Neighborhood for Good program, getting people out, volunteering in their local community, um, Vice Impact, you know, there's quite a few folks here from the media side uh, today, and they have an entire impact channel, um, which they've rolled out in the last year. Um, also, uh, Patagonia, and so their uh, Patagonia Action Word site is an entire site focused around what can you do. So we're watching, you know, the, the, the data as this area evolves. We're seeing more and more and more of a trend towards action because it's so because it's so powerful. So let's talk more action. So we wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, we, we looked at the data. There's um, a compelling story here for for why it makes you know, what it can do for your business if you choose to empower people to take action. But I think a lot of the hesitancy around a brand starts with, you know, is this the right time to tell that story? Do I have an authentic voice with that? Will this be, um, will this be authentic? And so we have um, a very kind of brief stress test, which kind of basically looks like, it looks at is this the right time for our organization to have a voice around a particular issue? And how will that be viewed by consumers before you can begin talking about it and, and moving on to action. And so the first comes um, with authenticity. So sometimes what the authenticity can look like um, is typically a company will start with their employees first. So do what you say, you know, starting with an employee program first so that it's, it's um, that your causes are throughout your organization before you extend out um, is a really important progression. Another piece of authenticity is you know, are the causes that you're working on related and core to your brand? You know, we talked about Patagonia for a minute. So they, um, they provide clothes for the outdoors, and so it's very natural for them to work on saving public lands and getting into the outdoors. So and this is abbreviated, um, and in case it's helpful, we do have a white paper that gets into all this stuff. This is, this is the short version um, around the stress test. But the second one around consistency. And so, you know, how has your organization stood behind us over time? Time makes a big difference. If I think about Ben and Jerry's. So Ben and Jerry's founders are known for really standing up behind the things that they care about. Ben and Jerry's has done a huge amount around refugees. How do refugees relate to ice cream? 
they've got cred because they've been standing behind issues kind of from the, from the beginning. And then finally, I really, um, bravery, I really appreciated Christie's comment this morning from Allstate about you know, doing the video about suicide. That was a really brave thing to do. Um, and so with that, you know, I think that also brings up kind of the point of that, you know, it's, it's tempting for a brand to, to align with sort of a vanilla issue because it's safe, but it's really important that that issue is, is engaging to people. And so part of, you know, telling your story, inviting people to take action alongside you is having a cause that you're working on, which also, um, you know, may take a little bit of bravery because it's what people are, are thinking about today. And with that, and I love these next data points, um, these are the causes that people want companies to be working on. And as we kind of tick through a few of them, LGBTQ rights, gun control, climate change, women's rights, racial equality, access to health care, job growth, immigration. So if I, I put a slide up, and, and, and I won't, but on the issues that companies are working on today, it doesn't map to this very well. You know, we've had some great examples over the last year, like Dick's Sporting Goods and some brands that were really brave and stood up behind breaking issues. Um, and it's, um, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's what people really want brands to do. So I think this is, I got a lot of ahas and, and pictures. Again, happy to share this presentation with anyone after so you don't feel like you have to write it all down. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Right, fake or news didn't exist Two words that haven't been maybe put together. <laughs> 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 but how much have these, do these change over time? They absolutely change over time. And I think that that's an excellent point in that, you know, we, we kind of started this by talking about the news. Most of these are big news issues right now. Gun control, it was the top three in Chicago for the last three years. That was one of them that didn't change over time, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, what, what we see is that, um, these change along with what the most important issues are in that time. It's, it's, it's what's going on around us. It tends less to be the more evergreen issue issues. Um, this data um, comes from Cone Communications. Um, just so you know, the mm -hmm. source wasn't us on this particular one. Sure. Just <coughs> because I, I appreciate that these are specific issues today, but I do think they all ladder up to the UN Sustainable Development. Yes, they do. great point. Are, if we look out, you know, another decade, those are really important. And I think what's helpful here is that this is digestible for companies to right. then see how they can help offset global challenges. Yeah, I thank you for bringing the US Sustainability Goals up because um, we're really committed <coughs> behind them. And I think it's a good way you know, it's a great framework for companies to see it at the highest level. And then, like you said, this begins to make it more digestible. Like, what does that mean? But thank you for bringing that up. I think I saw another hand. I wanted to know what your source was. But yeah. Then you said. Oh, okay. <laughs> I answered it before you got there. Yeah, code communications. So if, we're, if we've found our cause and we've made it through our stress test and we feel like... Um, you know, maybe even you have an existing program as a nonprofit. Maybe you're working with a company on, you know, with, um, with your nonprofit. Wanted to talk about the ladder of engagement um, in terms of how critical it is to choosing the actions that you're inspiring people to take. So at the highest level, the actions really matter. Um, and this kind of ties back to our roots. So my co-founder was um, led technology for the Obama 2012 campaign. And that was you know, an incredible <coughs> tech exercise around how do you ladder people up around cause, which is essentially what we're talking about here. And one of the surprising things that came out, uh, in particular to people typically who are in nonprofits or on the e-commerce side of things, is that there's a commonly held belief that if you ask, if you give people more than one action, that they'll do less of the thing you want. In other words, if I say donate something else, they're gonna donate less. So I better just tell them to do one thing which is absolutely true in e-commerce. Buy product now here, big red button. Um, actually around cause, it doesn't look that way. And so um, in the Obama 2012 campaign, they A-B tested. One page had donate, one had donate, volunteer, and share. This one with the three actions got more dollars in donations. You know, one is, okay, people don't want to be treated like an ATM. 
you know, another piece of that is that people have different things to give. Some people have time, some people have money. Mm -hmm. But finally, the kind of third vector of this is that there is a ladder of engagement. So when you begin to become interested about a cause, you're not going to sit on a nonprofit's board the next week, right? You've kind of got to come up that ladder. And so here, um, what you'll see is it really starts with engagement. So some great engagement actions. Take a quiz. Learn more about the issue. Share the cause pledge, sign up to learn more. So these are engagement actions that are really kind of focused around you know, awareness and education. And then as the person kind of becomes more familiar, further up, um, find an opioids treatment center, pledge to donate, volunteer, purchase a product. And so we're kind of moving up that ladder. And when, you know, whenever you meet a consumer, or like for us a reader in the news, you don't know where that person is on that ladder, so serving up multiple actions gives the opportunity for people who are already passionate about your issue to do something, as well as people who are like, yeah, I've been thinking about this, I just don't know that much about it, or who else cares about this. Um, so yeah, this is really just a, a piece on, on having kind of a, a multitude of, of actions. And um, crazy story, the, the, the most unusual action we've ever served was donate your kidney. Um, and in that, we saved two lives. Wow. And so, yeah, but it gets crazier. Um, so <laughs> the whole story is Dolly Parton's, Do the Dolly Parton's attorney um, needed a, a, a kidney donor. But he's in his 70s, so it's really hard to get a kidney donor if you're in your 70s from the donor supply list. So there's a nonprofit called, um, the, it's a, the Flood Sisters Kidney Foundation out of, out of New York. And what they do is they find kidney donors um, for people who need kidneys. And they came and they, they partnered with us. And so, you know, we, we put out a video and kind of the concept of Dolly Parton's attorney, Jerry, um, needs a kidney. And we had over 200 people raise their hands in the first 48 hours. Wow. Now, there should be a category in the Guinness Book of World Records for how many people have volunteered their kidney for you. But anyway, um, so we saved Jerry. We found a match. It's not easy to find a match. You have to have lots of hand raisers to find the right person. So we got the match, but the even better part of it is that because we had 200 hand raisers, there were lots of kidney donors. Mm -hmm. So we were able to save the life of a father in New Jersey who had just had a baby daughter with another one of those donors. So um, sky's the limit with actions, but um, thanks for letting me share that crazy story. Mm, that's great. But yeah, lots of actions. So, um, <coughs> So then it becomes kind of how do you get the word out? So you've got your program, you've got your actions. How do you, how do you amplify, amplify this out to the world? Um, and I think the big three we tend to think of is you throw an event, you push it through social media, you try to get earned media. Um, and those are all good channels, but they're, it, it's hard to scale and, and they're pricey. And so these are some interesting ways that other brands have done it. Um, one is Patagonia's um, ActionWorks platform. They actually did a homepage takeover, which was a really big deal on their homepage saying the president is stealing your land, famously. Mm -hmm. And so doing a homepage takeover, again, is a very brave thing to do, not something every brand can do. Mm -hmm. But that was one way to spread the word about their programming and their, and their actions. Um, Lyft riders, you may have seen the Roundup and Donate program if you're taking a Lyft. You can round up um, your tip to give to your nonprofit in your local area, so that's another good way. Um, the one thing to say on these is that it is limited to your own customers. And so um, one of the things that, that we're excited about about the news is that the news extends to people who you're not already talking to, to new people that are interested in the cause, and to new people um, that, are, that are interested in taking action. So with this, I want to tell you a little bit about a program we, we recently did, which is near and dear to our heart. It was actually before day one. So I love the name of the conference is from day one. But this is a Unilever <laughs> brand that um, they launched their mission on the 22nd of November. Their product launches next week in March. They said, we're going to launch mission even before product, which again was a really brave thing to do. So their mission is really interesting. It's, um, it's around homelessness, but what it's really about is giving people the right to dignity. And so lack of access to cleanliness is one of the things that people that are experiencing homelessness suffer from the most. It's hard to get a job if you don't have access to cleanliness. It's hard to move out of where you're at without that. And so this is their mission. 
And so what, um, what we did was we were able to serve up, um, we started with this impact action, um, which really measured how aware are people of this issue. So it asked, how many people do you think have lack of cleanliness in the US? And the answer showed that there's a pretty high level of awareness. It's, it's a big number. So that gave the brand the intelligence to kind of know, OK, people understand the level of magnitude of the issue. So it's going to be less about awareness and more about serving up the actual actions. Um, and then we placed these in, in different articles that related to homelessness. This one um, I love, Sesame Street. I don't know if you saw this in WGN, but they introduced a homeless puppet to, to represent um, Muppet, not puppet, Muppet. Sorry, Muppets, um, to represent that um, part of the population and then a number of other uh, news stories. So again, it's all about when people are motivated, when they're reading something, this is an opportunity for both nonprofits and brands to kind of get in front of people um, when they're motivated. So then wanted to, to just share a couple other campaigns. <coughs> Vaseline and NHL were not by accident. And so uh, with Vaseline, uh, we worked on a program with them where their, their goal was to make the Vaseline Healing Project famous. And so it's not famous yet. We've just mm -hmm. finished a pilot. Um, but with this, um, they sponsored natural disasters in 2018. So in articles about the California wildfires and articles about the hurricanes, then these impact actions allowed people to uh, watch a video to see and learn about the Healing Project and also make a donation to Direct Relief, which is the nonprofit first responder for the hurricanes. So it supported Direct Relief and it also served to help them let people know that they're giving away free product and support them in the work they're doing. And then this is our, our Hockey is for Everyone um, campaign, which also started with an impact question. Who broke barriers as the first uh, black hockey player to play in the NHL? And so this was featured throughout the month of February, um, which was Black History Month, and articles both about hockey, but also about Black History Month. So this just kind of brings to life um, what the, this new type of, of programming can do. Who is the person? It's Willie O'Reilly. Yeah. Willie yeah. O'Reilly. Surprisingly, well, and they, surprisingly, a lot of people got it right. And then the executor of the NHL said, wow, like people knew about this more. Can we begin to test other things and ask people other questions that we're not sure what the level of awareness is? And they said, We've been doing these programs for a long time. We're getting data. We're getting data that shows, shows us what people are thinking about. And so I think, again, you know, not to beat on an old drum, but what comes out of these programs is data. And that data can serve to be internal tools to justify why and how these programs make sense um, to the CFO, to the board, to the, at the investor level. So this concludes my data that I'm sharing with you. Would love to invite you to ask questions um, and kind of continue the conversation. We've got another couple minutes left. Um, first of all, thank you for validating my approach of asking people to do five things at once whenever I send them. Okay. <laughs> Time got it. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, thank you. Um, this is, I know maybe it's a high level question and I missed the very beginning of your presentation, but. You know, I'm thinking here, you know, cause marketing, philanthropy, mm -hmm. employee engagement, civic engagement, ad, you know, there's a lot of different buckets here in terms of, I'm wondering, your clients, are they pulling from their advertising dollars and their marketing dollars, or is this part of their philanthropic sort of corporate, like, what's the driver in terms of their budgets for this? That is a great question. And imagine a continuum slide here, mm -hmm. <laughs> which are, it really depends on where the client is and their purpose journey. So if they are kind of over here in, you know, kind of foundation land or CSR land, uh, you know, it's usually kind of coming out of, well, for CSR, it's coming out of the CSR budget to test it, to kind of prove it out. Um, and then taken to the more broader brand comms people, the CMO. Um, so that's in a company where it's still segmented. What we're seeing is purpose is becoming more and more and more of the center. You know, I talked about um, uh, Unilever before and Paul Pullman, the first thing he did in Unilever, not well, first, but one of the first things that he did was to say, I'm eliminating CSR. We are purpose. It shouldn't be over there in the corner. Mm -hmm. So in a Unilever, it becomes the, you know, the marketing folks, the brand managers that are thinking about this because it's not segmented anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the more segmented it is, 
Um, so, and, and like in some companies, you'll see CSR, PR, communications. Um, so typically what will happen is the initial pilot will be pulled out of whatever champion has come across this. So it could be innovation, could be CSR, mm -hmm. um, could be PR. And then uh, if it's expanded beyond the pilot form, you know, once you get that data, then it can be pulled out of the main advertising budget. I mean, Unilever has announced that they're spending 50% of their um, marketing budget on social impact in the wow. next year. So then a quest, follow up question. So it depends yeah. on the company. I, I imagine, and it's something that I'm, I'm a nonprofit who struggles with this in terms of my pitches. Yeah, example. because who knows the, who the right title right, is. Where, where yeah. it comes in, I am on gun violence, and so there's, that's more controversial. But that's really is, hard. is there a correlation between advertising, marketing dollars on these cause related impact campaigns and benefit to the nonprofit community? It depends on the campaign. Okay. I mean, you know, and then we can get into broader things like there, there is a trend, um, so it depends. There's multiple different types of purpose programs. Mm -hmm. Some purpose programs are more communication oriented, like what we're talking about here, and these benefit nonprofits. Yeah. And it's about communication and you're getting, you know, you're getting more donors, you're getting more people interested in the cause because you're in the news. Um, at the same time, in sustainability, more generally, there is a trend towards you know, companies, Target is an example, where they're putting more of their dollars towards um, sustainability practices, and then they feel like, well, they've, they've invested in that, so then they have less money to give out from a philanthropic standpoint. Right. And so I think from, from a nonprofit's point of view, there's gonna, the pot of philanthropy is shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, but the need for brands to grow their social impact um, their, you know, kind of grow awareness around their social impact is growing. So it's a matter of beginning the conversations, you know, with the purpose brands around communications because there's that budget is growing versus the philanthropy C CSR budgets, which are becoming smaller. Okay, gotcha. Is Thank that you. helpful? <clears throat> I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm on the board of the children's museum, you know, and we, we're really looking at like, it's just yeah. harder to get, Companies to write a check to a nonprofit. Like the money isn't there. And the people want to and they want to support it, but the money isn't there. And so part of the challenge is, you know, part of what, what we do for nonprofits is what this does to the business is they get to give to your nonprofit and they get credit for it and it helps change their brand. So it, it has become a world in which um, to get support as a nonprofit, there has to be and what does it do for me at the business level for the brand in order to get the dollars. Mm -hmm. I work for a company that, you know, we, we kind of keep our uh, purse strings rather tight. And when we get approached by companies like Red Cross, you know, we, we really want to donate, but it's just, you know, we don't, it's not that we don't have that means. What we uh, have done in the past, we're a distribution company of products that go into hotels. So a lot of times we'll give uh, product, like in-kind donations. But then uh, the other thing that we started doing several years ago is having a volunteer fair for our associates and it was an opportunity to bring in uh, a lot of different charities and volunteer opportunities to our associates because we give 16 hours a year for paid volunteer time and it helps our employees because the, you know there's a, a something for everyone you know whether yeah. you want to donate your time to a uh, a lot of therapy yeah. Or, or yeah you know just uh, a wide array of things so that's one way that we've started engaging uh, with charities and I'm hopeful as a um, sustainability professional that eventually that does you know kind of translate into dollars ultimately because yeah. we do raise money internally among our employees yeah absolutely and that those sound like great programs it's kind of sort of like help where you can Right, exactly. Do you have intentions to expand your platform further than just news outlets? Yes. Um, our goal is to make all content actionable. We started with news um, as an obvious place because great you know, journalism and storytelling um, is sort of low-hanging fruit and, and we could get to scale very quickly. Um, we will look to making other types of content actionable so that you know, a blogger can add a social impact actions to their blog. And this can really grow so that 
um, eventually even consumers can leverage the technology to make what they're doing actionable. Yeah, great. Also, I mean, the brands and nonprofits also use this, this technology. So one of the things we do, we're um, a double bottom line company of both profitability and impact. So um, for our nonprofits, as an example, many nonprofits will run campaigns even without a brand sponsor. Some have a brand that work alongside them. Some like the American Institute of Cancer Research just ran a campaign around Cancer Research Month. Um, but once they've run this campaign um, in the news, then you know, we give free use of the technology of the actions you know, for, for the nonprofit. So we're able to really, um, that has allowed nonprofits to put it on their content, brands to put it on their websites and their blogs. So right now, although news is where we're pushing, our clients are using it, this technology in all of their platforms in addition to news. What um, is it safety measures do you have in place for something like that? Like. I was with the YMCA at one point and we looked into this as well. Um, but if we were trying to run a campaign tied to people who looked at articles about the why or some other keywords that we could use, I mean, how do you prevent it, and this was one of our concerns, how do you prevent it from placing an ad for the why and donating or volunteering for a news article where a child had died, drowned in a pool at the Y, or there was a right. sex abuse scandal or yes. something like that. What are the safety measures to prevent tying yourself to a negative news story yeah. <laughs> and asking for money? Yeah, time? so there's two answers to that. Um, the first is um, we, we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning to analyze the content and understand the content, which is much more sophisticated than keywords. So we can use the technology to discern um, what article is an appropriate placement given that particular campaign. So the tech. Um, but then I'm going to say part two. And part two is that, um, and this does not apply to the child drowning in the pool, but part two is that um, people are more motivated to take action from an emotional article. Absolutely. And I think brands and nonprofits are kind of, I've been trying, but kind of think like, oh, I don't want to be in anything emotional. But like, when we looked at hurricane response rate, the, the articles where people took the most amount of actions, you know, one was like this poor dog that got abandoned. You know, it wasn't even about people, and the, the impact actions were to support people affected by the hurricane. But it was emotional, you know, you felt bad. Another guy had his, his house ransacked when he was off working and helping victims. It's a terrible story. But even though that was kind of a sad story that someone broke into his home when he was off helping victims, it moved people, and they took action. So part of it is, is avoiding those negative news stories that are a train wreck, like the one you responded to, but also recognizing that you know, um, being involved in an emotional story can have a lot of power. And if you try to stay away from emotion, you kind of lose some of the opportunity. Great, we've got one more minute. The disaster. <laughs> You're liable for the disaster. Do you have a um, competition with sponsoring of our articles? Like, for instance, the help of Hurricane Florence? Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, with, with that in particular, um, we were working directly with the Arbor Day Foundation. And so, um, yeah, so we continue to build our, our partners in news and content. Um, climate change is a big issue right now. But now we are, you know, to your question too, outside of news, we partner with specialty magazines like Backpacker, you know, National Geographic. And so um, we are a platform that is, that is growing to meet both the demand of the causes that are being sponsored as well as um, you know, kind of the publisher side. Great. Quick question. Sure. So climate change, just as an example, is so politically loaded. Right. Um, and it seems to me so risky to attach to, as a corporation, yeah. to attach. Do you have any thoughts about that? My thought is that, that um, I think there, there is a bit of risk around it. We're currently running a campaign with the Gage Foundation, but I hope that brands can find a way to live with that risk because the world really needs their help because it's a really pressing problem. And so what we're seeing with brands, they'll usually take um, kind of a piece of it, you know, like they'll focus on the plastics portion of it, you know, or a, a particular nuance of it. Um, versus the overall arching of, of climate change. But yeah, we, we work hard to think about how can a brand get involved with a cause like climate change or like gun violence? How can we make it safer for the brand? You know, how can we reduce risk? Um, and one of the things, you know, especially in digital technology, you can slowly scale it. 
Great. Well, we're out of time. Thanks for your time and attention. Yeah. Yeah.